Today, uh, Dialogues Without Frontiers has the satisfaction of receiving Professor Byron Hammond. Welcome, Professor Hammond. Uh, well, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Professor Hammond is uh, assistant professor at the Ohio State University in the United States. He is a scholar specialized on several subjects, but particularly on 16th century America and Spain and the relationship between the two areas settled by the Spaniards. And uh, he's, uh, he has been studying not only the uh, Mexican context, but also the Spani Spanish context. And he's a specialist uh, on, a, on the subject of our talk today, that is the translations of Antonio de Nebrija, uh, the early translations of um, Mesoamerican texts. So I would like to, to start, Professor Hammond, uh, uh, if you can talk to us about um, Antonio de Nebrija. All right, well, he was a very important Spanish humanist. Uh, in the 1480s, he went from Spain where he was born to study in uh, Bologna in Italy, which was a really cutting edge place for language work at the time. Uh, there, people studying ancient Greece and Rome were saying, wait, all this medieval Latin is terrible. We need to go back to Cicero. Uh, so it was a really radical approach that Nebrija learns in Italy. And then he brings this back to, to Spain, to the University of Salamanca. And in several of, he te of his texts, he writes about the, the barbarity of Spain, of uh, Latin as it's being spoken. So that's kind of his formation. And he writes a, a grammar of Latin, uh, all sorts of texts, and then he translates it into Castilian. The first one is just Latin, and uh, then he does a. Uh, he starts getting interested in, in Spanish as a as a as a subject to study. And uh, people at the time usually thought, you know, vernacular languages weren't very interesting. Real language was Greece, Rome, you know, Greek, Latin, Hebrew. But uh, he publishes the first grammar of a Castilian of a, a vernacular language. And then he creates a dictionary from Latin to Spanish and then Spanish to Latin, uh, which is also fairly innovative at the time, uh, doing a two-way dictionary for translating one language to the other. So that's sort of where my current project took off from, these uh, Spanish-Latin, Latin-Spanish dictionaries. So he had a kind of a very classical uh, education. Absolutely. In this period Absolutely. of uh, uh, Renaissance. And, uh, but, uh, when then, later on, he is uh, linked to, with the uh, Spanish con conquest of the Americas, right. and specifically right. the Mexican, Mesoamerican uh, documents. So uh, how this very classical guy <laughs> went to the, such a uh, different subject? Right. So um, I, there, there are two ways to answer this. Uh, so in 1492, very symbolic year, he publishes this, this grammar of Spanish, which again is the first grammar of vernacular published in Europe. And he dedicates it to Isabella and Ferdinand. And he talks about the need to kind of linguistically unite and reduce Spanish to a perfect form. Because uh, Ferdinand and Is Isabella are now going to be ru ruling over all sorts of barbarians, uh, barbarians, by which he mostly means Granada at this point, the kingdom, <laughs> the Muslim kingdom has fallen uh, to the forces of, of the Catholic monarchs. Um, but of course, that he's saying this in 1492 is very symbolic because shortly thereafter, obviously, Christopher Columbus discovered or stumbles across the New World and all sorts of connections then start happening. Um, although that, that particular, so that's, that's one point. Uh, the connection to Mexico is this Spanish Latin, Latin Spanish dictionary he creates becomes a bestseller, like it's reprinted. Uh, I think maybe 15 times over the course of the 16th century in all sorts of European cities, like in Granada, uh, Salamanca, Seville. There are four different versions published in Antwerp and in the Netherlands. Uh, and so, this, so it's a very popular text. And what happens is that, uh, say, missionaries, when they go, well, to Granada, for example, and they want to translate Spanish into Arabic, uh, they often just take Nebrija's dictionary, Spanish to Latin, they keep the list of Spanish entries, but then they replace, say, the Latin with Arabic. That's our mm -hmm. first sort of translation of Nebrija, which gets published in Granada, 1505, a Spanish to Lat uh, sorry, Spanish to Arabic dictionary and a grammar. Uh, and then same things happens. Uh, one of the versions published in Seville of this Spanish Latin dictionary, published in 1516, travels to Mexico City, and there, 
rather amazingly, Native Americans who speak Nahuatl make a, a manuscript copy. So they copy out all of the entries in black ink into their own little book. And then after each one, after each entry, each Spanish to Latin entry in red ink, they write the entry in Nahuatl. So they create their own dictionary, a trilingual dictionary for Spanish, Latin, Nahuatl. Uh, that's the first actually, interestingly, dictionary for translation that survives that we have. It's actually created by Native Americans. Uh, obviously, missionaries in the New World are also using this text to translate. So in 1555, a Franciscan publishes, a, again, Spanish to Nahuatl dictionary, again, based on Nebrija. That gets then used, the Spanish Nahuatl. The Nahuatl is replaced with Parapecha in Western Mexico. Uh, other versions of like the later printings of, uh, of Nabriha's book from Europe travel to the New World. So you get a Spanish to say Zapotec or Spanish uh, Quechua dictionaries in, in the Americas. So, so it's a story of how this one set of dictionaries, Spanish to Latin, which are always being revised over the 16th century, then kind of have children as it were uh, and uh, are transformed into uh, dictionaries of other languages. Uh, so that directly and indirectly it, inf it influences a lot of people in the Americas trying to get to come about the, um, the, the different languages in the continent. Exactly. Even in Brazil in the, in the same period, the, the, uh, the Jesuits were also inspired by, by Nebrija to produce their own uh, first dictionary and then grammar of the native Brazilian languages. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it ins he inspired several people Absolutely. in a way. And I would also add that uh, the same thing happens in Europe actually, so that Nebrija's Spanish Latin gets used in London to create a Spanish Latin English dictionary, uh, or it gets used in say Venice to create a, create a Spanish to Italian dictionary, and we have Spanish French dictionary. So it's very interesting that this core text uh, is being used in the New World for missionary purposes, but of course also in Granada for missionary mm -hmm. purposes, but also being used to translate you know, things like English and, uh, and, uh, para and, and French uh, for a book published in Paris. So it uh, has a kind of, and we even have a Spanish to Tagalog dictionary published in the Philippines early in the 17th century. And it looks like that is actually based, its entries have been copied from one of the Spanish English dictionaries, which in turn were based on one of the Spanish Latin dictionaries. So it's, uh, it very much has a global influence, at least on you know, three continents, in Asia, in Europe, and throughout the Americas. And in the case specifically of Mesoamerican languages, mm -hmm. um, what would you say about the importance of this for our understanding of the, these native languages? Because in the case of English or Italian, we could have a lot of more information from other sources. But uh, that's not the case with the uh, Mesoamerican or Mexican uh, uh, languages. Right, exactly. So in many cases, uh, these translating dictionaries are our earliest and sometimes our longest records of particular language, indigenous languages from the 16th century. Nahuatl, of course, has hundreds of manuscript documents, uh, but th that's not true of Mixtec, say, or Zapotec in the 16th century. So they're incredibly rich resources for seeing how indigenous people categorize their world. Of course, the challenge is, since, say, your Spanish to Zapotec dictionary, uh, created in Oaxaca in Mexico, is being based, or its, its Spanish categories are based on a Spanish Latin dictionary, originally created to translate concepts from the ancient Mediterranean. Actually, Nebrija is, when he creates his dictionary, he goes to primary sources. He like reads Cicero, he uh, reads all these ancient languages and gets his usage out of those. So this means that there's always a danger when we see a, a Spanish language category in one of these Spanish to Mesoamerican dictionaries. Is that category there because there's a Native American concept that is being translated, or is it a category that's there because it was in the Spanish Latin source and is really a category from the ancient, ancient Mediterranean? Uh, there's a very famous example, again, from one of these Spanish Zapotec dictionaries where we have a whole series of entries for divination categories, fortune telling. Mm. And there's a, so there's a Spanish entry for divination by flocks of birds, divination by animal entrails, divination by air, wind, fire, and water. Uh, 
These are, of course, all categories that the ancient Romans used. And indeed, if we compare the Spanish Zapotec Dictionary with its Spanish Latin source, we see that the, the Spanish categories have been copied uh, directly from the European source, which is why, for example, the Zapotec translation of you know, divination by sacrifice, which is the ancient Roman practice of harrow species, right? You cut up an animal and read its liver. Uh, the Zapotec person asked to translate that is obviously very confused because literally the, the, cat, the, the word, the, the Zapotec word means to tell the, for, to tell the future with beans, like, mm. you know, the vegetable, right? Yeah. Which, is a, which is a Mesoamerican category. So even here we can see how a Native American faced with this very sacrifice by sacrifice fortune telling what is this I don't understand this at all <laughs> uh, tries to understand it in terms of, of and, their uh, own categories uh, so this is one specific problem th that relates to the fact that the, the, the interest was very much in having the European language translate into the native mm -hmm. but um, uh, how would you characterize the possibility of having a specific um, native concepts translate so beginning starting with the native language and then going right. to Spanish well, this is, this is a very interesting, and in fact, by knowing what specific Spanish Latin dictionary was used to create, say, a Spanish Nahuatl dictionary, we can see both when categories are just being copied from the European source and when they're actually being expanded to deal with new Native American concepts. So, for example, in one of these Spanish to Nahuatl dictionaries from, from Mexico City, uh, we look, you can look at the the entry for to shine or to glitter, uh, relumbrar or relucir in Spanish. The original European source has just this one line. The central Mexican source for Spanish to Nahuatl has like four lines to shine or to glitter, and there's one for to shine or glitter like fish in the water yes. or ants on an anthill, to shine or glitter like quetzal feathers or silk. Uh, so it's very clear, and then there's distinct verbs that follow that are very different in Nahuatl. So in this case, we can see how a European category is borrowed, but then expanded. The same things happens with uh, entries for foam. So the, the European source has pewter foam, like the, the foam created from casting pewter, uh, foam from water. But in the new world, we get a new, a new category in, in Mexico, which is chocolate foam, because of course mm, chocolate of, was, of was course. very important for the Aztecs. So knowing both sides of the story, you can very much see when the indigenous categories transform the, the source list and, and you know, make, the, uh, make uh, uh, the European categories change. Actually, the Franciscan friar Molina, who published the first Spanish to Nahuatl dictionary, actually in his introduction, he says he actually made up a new Spanish term abajador in order to capture a specific Nahuatl term for someone who takes things down. So he oh, even admits to uh, creating a, a Spanish new, neologisms, new yes, yeah. to deal with specifics of Native American categories. Well, th thank you so much, Professor Hammond, uh, for coming to our show. I, uh, I'm sure that our public is very much uh, well informed now, but much better informed now about uh, the importance of this kind of um, erudite uh, scholarship in the early 16th century by this um, Antonio de Nebrija uh, that is n not only a source for European history, European uh, culture, but also here in, 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 uh, in the Americas. So th thank you so much for coming. Great. Thank you very much. I remind everybody that uh, this program and all the others are available on the website of the RTV Unicamp station, uh, also in the um, YouTube channel, RTV channel. And uh, with this, I invite everybody to the next issue of Dialogues Without Frontier.